I'm going to talk to you today about why genetics are important and some people find this a very boring subject and others get excited. Hopefully I'll make it somewhat exciting. Why genetics are important? What can we learn from trying to understand the genetics of honeybees? What can it tell you? And I actually got into beekeeping just as a beekeeper wanting to make honey because I love honey and um, I did my PhD on the genetics of honeybees. It was a huge learning curve for me because I didn't have a big genetic background. Uh, but once I started learning how, what the genetics were, what the simple system, simple, not so simple system was, and how to magically extract DNA from honeybees, I really started to fully appreciate how a honeybee colony operates um, and how honeybees have evolved different traits and behaviors over time. And so really, it can tell you about basic biology, it can tell you about better management techniques, um, selecting for desirable traits. Of course, any breeder needs to have a basic understanding of genetics. Genetic heritage, understanding the maternal ancestry, which is something that I do a lot in my work with honeybees, and also the genetic diversity, because we all know how important genetic diversity is for survival. So why genetics are important? Well, Apis vampira, you can see here, and the jacko bee. You can make very interesting things if you know how to breed properly. You can get different traits into your lines. This is obviously an exaggeration, my weird sense of humor coming through. Um, but you can really select for a trait and amplify that trait if you understand breeding and genetics. So a little bit of background on DNA, because I'm not sure how what the what the knowledge base of the audience is. Maybe I have some evolutionary biologists or population geneticists in the, in the audience, so this will be easy. Um, and for others of you, you might just gloss over and that's totally fine too. But DNA, uh, deoxyribonucleic acid, is actually in all of our cells. And there's two main kinds that we use and that exist for us to understand individuals, populations, um, and communities. And the first one is mitochondrial DNA. You can see it, let's see, laser. You can see it pictured right here, um, and it's circular. Um, and all of these different colored areas are different regions on the mitochondrial DNA that are responsible for different cellular functions. Um, so it's found in the cytoplasm of all cells, and it's maternally inherited. So my mitochondrial DNA I got from my mom, and she got it from her mom, who got it from her mom. So by looking at this mitochondrial DNA, you can trace back maternal ancestry, which is awesome. Now, nuclear DNA is also found in the nucleus, a different area of all living cells. It's the double-stranded helix that you see here. And what's interesting and unique uh, if you use nuclear DNA is that you're understanding what's being passed down from not only the mother, but also the father. And also, nuclear DNA contains coding regions that actually code for behavior, traits, morphology. Okay? So it's very important to be able to understand kind of how this nuclear DNA is being passed down from parents to offspring. And in our cases, or us, our cases, yes, would be queens and drones to workers, et cetera. So its genes are the specific regions of chromosomes on the DNA that contain the information that codes for certain proteins that then elicit some type of response. All right, so we're going to go to the basics, um, trying to understand the genetics in honeybees. And so female honeybees have 16 pairs of chromosomes, okay, so 32 in all. And they have one pair of sex chromosomes. Okay, there they are, for simplicity, these black lines. And they have different loci. There's a diversity of loci that exist of sex chromosome, on sex chromosomes. And so you can see here, for simplicity purposes, I'm going to use color. We have a red sex locus and a blue sex locus. So that's what you would see in a female honeybee. They have 16 pairs. Now, if we look at the cast genetics and the nuclear DNA across the casts, you can see here in the queen, they're diploid. They have these 16 pairs, uh, 32 chromosomes in total, and there are her, that's her sex chromosomes. Out of that um, 32 chromosomes are 16 pairs. Now, the drone, the male, is haploid. He only has one set of chromosomes, okay? And so, therefore, he only has one sex chromosome. You see, I made his green. I don't know why. 
And then the worker, again, female, diploid, has two pairs, uh, I mean 16 pairs, excuse me, 32 chromosomes, and those are her sex chromosomes. So that's kind of a real simplistic view of the nuclear breakdown um, inside of, of different honeybee casts. Now if we look at the basic biology and try to understand mating genetics, and I know Juliana beautifully talked about some of this, um, if we think about it, you have the queen here, right here, and she has these two sex chromosomes, this red and this pink one. And if you imagine that she's flying at a DCA and she has this comet of drones chasing her, these are all their sex chromosomes flying too. Um, so you can actually see the color breakdown and the differences. This would represent diversity in this sex locus or sex gene. If she was to mate with all of those, which she probably will, you can see her spermatheca, where she holds the sperm from all of these different drones, would contain this diversity of sperm, containing that sex locus. Okay, so this is her spermatheca filled of stored sperm. Um, and what happens when she goes back to the colony and actually starts to lay eggs is that you, it, it will end up being many different subfamilies or patrilines inside that colony. And what I mean by that is the workers that she could make is she would donate. She can either donate a red sex chromosome or a pink one. And then that would go with one of these male sperm sex chromosomes. So her workers could be red and yellow. So that represents one union from her and a drone. Uh, or she could donate the pink one to the male's purple one here. And so as you go through, if I was to take a sample of these workers from a colony and look at their genetics, just by looking at their genetics, I can determine how well mated she is, how many different daddies are represented in that colony or patrilines. So in this particular example, we have six subfamilies or patrilines represented. We have this one here. You can see here they both share the... Um, the dad, right, the yellow chromosome. And then we have this one here. We, it both shares the purple dad chromosome. And there's a third one there, a unique one, a green one. And fourth, fifth, and then sixth. So does that make sense how you could just simply take a sample of workers, look at their genetics, and actually be able to determine how many drones that queen is mated with? Is that females are diploid and males are haploid? meaning they have that two, uh, 16 pairs uh, or 32 chromosomes versus one pair, the 16 chromosomes. And this haplodiploidy specifically is this differentiation between male and female. The males are haploid, the females are diploid. So viable drones come from unfertilized eggs. So the queen lays an egg, she does not release sperm, and therefore the egg's laid and it's, it's haploid, okay? Females come from fertilized eggs, okay? So in sex determination, if an egg is heterozygous at the sex loci, and do you remember that, I'll go through a diagram in a minute, but do you remember that first picture I showed you with the two sex chromosomes? If the sex chromosome that the female contributes and the one that the drone contributes are the same, so both red, right, then you will have an unviable diploid drone. Okay, so really sex determination is whether you are heterozygous, the same at the sex locus, or if you're diff or a homozygous, the same at the sex locus, or heterozygous, different at the sex, lo sex locus, that's hard to say. But I'll go through a really good um, diagram of this, and it'll make more sense. Only if the egg is unfertilized will it result in a viable drone. So here is the example we'll walk through. I'm going to stand over here. So you can see this queen that I showed you before. These are her sex chromosomes, two of those 16 pairs. And we have a blue and a red. If she were to go out mating and she sees this beautiful drone who has a blue chromosome, the offspring that they could create, one example, if she was to donate or, or not fertilize her eggs at all, okay? So she just lays the eggs. She does not fertilize them. She, it would result in a viable haploid blue drone or a viable haploid red drone. That's one outcome if she chooses not to fertilize the egg, not to release sperm. The other outcome is that if she chooses to fertilize her eggs, it could go one of two ways. 
If she donates a blue chromosome to his blue chromosome, then it's going to be a diploid, unviable drone, a diploid drone, which will be eaten out by the workers in the cells. And that's what we refer to as shotgun brood pattern in the US. I don't know if you call it something else here. And so that is a sign of inbreeding, okay? Now, sometimes it's not that noticeable too if they're inbred. It depends on the degree of relatedness between the drones and the comet and the queen. Because if she were to still maybe be related to this fella here, but donate the red to his blue, then it would result in a viable diploid worker, a female. Because they're different at the sex lo loci, so therefore it's a female. Okay? If it's the same at the sex loci, then it is a male, an unviable male. So that kind of explains kind of some of the problems we see in our colonies sometimes. Now this is the better scenario. If she were to go a little bit further, maybe to a different DCA, uh, maybe meet some drones from out of town, you can see here that no matter what, if she were to mate with him, it's going to result in viable female offspring because they are all different. No matter what the combinations are, they're different at the sex locus. Okay. So why should we care about all of this? Well, better management technique, techniques. We can understand what's going, in, going on in our hives by understanding the simple diagrams. Drone layers simply aren't mated. So what are they going to produce no matter what? Drones. Well, yeah, that's kind of obvious. Drone layer. I didn't really think about that. But yes, you're absolutely right. Good, good job. Um, and you can see here the spermatheca from a virgin that kind of clear glass ball versus a spermatheca from a mated queen, okay? Um, and you don't want to sit there going around grabbing your queens and popping out the spermatheca all the time because, you know, it's your queen. Um, but if you see this constant laying of drones, then this is something you might want to think about. Has she not been mated? Is she a virgin? Is something wrong with her reproductive tract where she can't release the sperm? So this will give you some ideas into maybe why you're only getting males. The eggs aren't becoming fertilized. So I think this is just fascinating. All right, and again, I already talked about the shotgun brood pattern, this kind of spotty, very ugly laying pattern. And like I said, now with this VSH trait, um, it's kind of hard to distinguish between the VSH trait and the shotgun brood pattern, but this is a clear sign of inbreeding, that, diplo that the queen is, more, is too related to the drone she's mating with. Therefore, diploid drones are a result, and therefore the workers sense th that they smell funny, that they're not correct, and they'll go in and eat out the larvae, creating this shotgun pattern in your brood. Okay, so why also some queens get superseded? The queen runs out of sperm, right? That's one big thing that can happen, is that over time, the queen will deplete her stores of viable sperm. And this has been shown to be linked with the pheromones that she releases, giving an idea to the workers of her overall quality. So this is another thing to really understand. Once you start to see supersedure cells, okay, maybe she's running out of sperm. Also a spotty brood pattern. She could be running out of sperm. So who is responsible for behavior and traits in the colony? Well, drones are a part of the picture. Even though we like to call them flying gonads, they are a little bit more than that. I bet that makes a lot of the males in the audience feel very good right now. Uh, but the mother, the queen, really does control a lot of the traits that you're going to see in your workers. She is the mother of all. She uses chemical control to keep everybody in check. All phenotypes are, and traits, behaviors, are really inherited from her. And she and her daughters control the sex ratio within, within the hive. She really determines the value of the hive because she's laying the eggs. So it's her reproductive quality that really sets the stage for the colony health. Uh, she produces that pheromone also, which provides colony cohesion. The queens vary in their ability to perform these functions, and we've all seen that probably in our own hives. Some queens are just marvelous and great, and others are just, they're just petering along, and you're like, should I pinch her? Should I give her another, another week? You know, I'm sure some of you can relate to some of those questions. <laughs> So, but the conditions under which these queens are reared, the conditions in which colonies are placed, 
all affect how they're going to behave in your, in your apiary. So we've already gone through a lot of this QMP, but I think it's a good thing to always kind of be re, uh, refreshed. Um, that the chemicals that she lets off really set the stage for the retinue and the care that she's giving, how she's cleaned, how she's fed, all of those things that occur after she is already mated. So um, we know that this is a pheromone, this is an oily odor that's on her exoskeleton that's released by her, and it's through antennal contact as well as through trophallaxis, mouth part contact and grooming, that this chemical is spread and it's spread to all members of the colony. I like this picture here because it really gives a good idea. If you have this queen pheromone, you can see the retinue around her um, and how they're cleaning her, and then you can see how they would turn to the side and maybe start feeding and talking and regurgitating to another bee next door and passing that queen pheromone on. So the substance has a lot of different functions, that retinue behavior, like I said, the inhibition or, uh, of rearing replacement queens, sex attraction, swarm stabilization, stimulation of foraging and brood rearing. And a lot of this really is a feedback system. Um, it's not just the queen pheromone, but um, and I'm showing you some pictures of some of the functions here of the queen substance. Sex attraction, swarm stabilization, Stimulation of foraging and brood rearing. And this is what I was just speaking of when I talk about a feedback loop. The environmental cues that are picked up and that nectar and pollen coming in is a feedback mechanism to get the queen to start laying, which is also a feedback mechanism for the workers to go out and get more pollen and nectar. So a lot of this is beautifully designed to be in tune with the environmental cues that the colony is receiving. Also, the suppression of worker ovaries. And I know Juliana showed a really cool picture. Here you can see that is a queen's worker or ov ovaries um, on right there. And these are the ovaries of a laying worker. Here's another picture of food and pheromone transmission. And the other thing I wanted to talk about, because this is a common subject with humans as well, nature versus nurture. Right? And so, um, you know, genetics is important, uh, but also environmental factors and that important feedback of the environmental cues to these very sensitive, sensitive insects, these honeybees that have all of these sensory apparati or apparatus, you know, on their heads, on their bodies. And so, depending on where you put your colony or your apiary, you're going to have bees that might respond quite differently. So if I was to have a colony in the Sonoran Desert, it would be very, behave very differently in that apiary than if I moved it to the mid-Atlantic in North America at the University of Delaware. They would behave very differently. And this is very, very common because they are not adapted to the different environment. And we can see here, um, the different types of environments we do place bees in, some of them more bee friendly than others. But you can imagine bees put in these types of environments are going to behave very differently. They're going to produce honey very differently. They're going to be, de defend their nest very differently in these environments. So if we look at breeding, we look at trait selection, it all comes down to genetic diversity. And genetic diversity must be present in order to select for a trait. You need it. You, if there's no genetic diversity, then you're just going to get clones. Um, but if there's genetic diversity, the raw material for selection, you can start comparing the function or a certain trait, looking at the diverse ways they, they um, show their trait or, or respond, and then you can start breeding for it. You can start taking that queen that you really like the way her brood pattern is, and they're very nice bees, and you can start breeding from her. And so a lot of breeding involves the identification of colonies with these desirable traits, and the selection of queen and drone mothers for the next generation. Because not only do you need to like the traits of the queen, it's very important to select for your drones. Now this has been done a lot, 
in all countries. Um, temperament is a big one that is selected for Africanized versus Italian honeybees versus um, uh, all different sorts of bees um, are selected for. Um, and even the Russian bees, when they were first brought over to North America, I worked with some of the early colonies uh, that were brought over. And some of them were just awful. You'd open them up and they'd just be boiling out of the sides and you hold up the frame and they were like, Ugh. they're so nervous, you know, and it was really hard to be able to even, it, they made me uncomfortable and nervous working them. And now they've really come a long way with the temperament of some of these Russian lines. So also pollen collecting. Um, there's one pollen collecting line that's been kept at UC Davis for years and it's a very high pollen hoarding strain. They've selected it over and over just to forage for pollen. However, when you select that heavily, when the selection pressure is that strong on one trait, you'll, yes, you'll amplify that trait, but what's gonna happen to maybe some other traits? You're gonna lose them. So it's a very fine balance when you're breeding, um, when you're selecting so strongly for something else, what else are you losing in the meantime? So that particular pollen hoarding trait at line, excuse me, is actually quite sickly. It cannot be kept alive outside of the lab. It's only for research purposes because it has no, um, uh, what's that, um, immune, it, you know, it, can't, it, can't, it can't not get sick. I can't even speak. I think I've given too many talks. I think I'm done. No, I'm <laughs> um, but it's, it, it's very vulnerable to getting sick because it doesn't have anything to fight back. Also, selection for specific types of pollen. They've been able to do that. Select for bees that can go just for alfalfa. Um, so you can see how that might be useful if you're trying to get a good yield off a particular crop. Also, honey production. Um, there's variability in this trait as well. In most of the traits in honeybees, there is quite a bit of variability. These are some other traits that people select for. Swarming behavior, the re re you know, reduction of swarming behavior. Uh, overwintering ability, which is really big where I live. Uh, winter is a very, very tough time, and we all have our fingers crossed about February, going, oh my gosh, please, please, please. Um, and so that's a big one for us. Disease resistance, behavioral, physiological. Of course, you're familiar with hygienic behavior, um, VS VSH line, SMR lines, Buckfast, also Russian. And so these have, are basically really starting to select for tolerance or some sort of resistance to AFB, Varroa, et cetera. And the really best example that we really see now in the colonies in the US is this VSH. And you can see this was mainly um, worked on uh, in the USDA lab in Baton Rouge uh, by Jeff Harris and Bob Danka. And they worked so hard on selecting for this trait but, and Jeff Harris is so knowledgeable and wonderful, if you ever get a chance to talk to him about his story behind developing and selecting for this trait. Because just like I said, it, it took a long time to get this trait in the line. And every time, every generation where they're pushing this trait, they're losing genetic diversity. And they're starting to lose some of the other important features that they also wanted in the line. And so it was really difficult. But you can see the bees here expressing this VSH trait right here. They're actually pulling out a pupae um, that was capped. They were pulled back the wax, and they're pulling it out. And you can see here what it kind of looks like. This is actually from a hygienic behavior test, not a VSH test. But it's the same idea, that the larvae are killed, and, or the pupae or larvae are killed, and then how quickly do the other bees go and detect and start pulling out those dead larvae. So it's a test for hygienic behavior. Um, so these are just some of the interesting work done on genetics. Here's a picture I showed in one of my other lectures here, uh, courtesy of the Meridian beekeepers here. And this is VSH and showing that these workers are grooming mites and biting them off. You can see the exoskeleton of this mite right here. There's a bite mark. Um, and also, these are all pupil antennae, pupil parts. So they're pulling out pupae and actually really showing this hygienic behavior that's associated with the VSH trait. All right, so overall, using stock improvement techniques, using breeding techniques, you can improve stock. 
It is an efficient way, but it's really hard. So we gotta give our breeders a lot of respect because it is difficult, difficult work in order to keep a healthy line that has all of the traits we want in that bee. So what else can we learn from looking at genetics? Well, there's been a lot of work showing the importance of diversity at the colony level. So that picture that I showed you earlier of the colony and all the different patra lines, so all those workers that have different daddies, the more daddies a colony has, studies have shown that they dance better, they're more efficient at the waggle dance and transferring information to floral resources. So that's one benefit of colony level diversity. Another one is that colony level diversity is very important for being able to respond to pests and pathogens. They have more of a genetic toolkit available to, to them to be able to ward off different diseases. Also, the microbiome, which we know how important the microbiome of the honeybee gut is. It helps them assimilate food. It helps them actually inoculate their food with different beneficial bacteria and yeasts to be able to get the nutrients out of pollen. And when bees are more diverse at the colony level, meaning that the queen's more promiscuous, there's more dads, then there's more beneficial bacteria. And they have a healthier microbiome. And so a lot of really fabulous work showing the importance of colony diversity. So a recap on mitochondrial DNA, because I'm going to go on, off in a different tangent. Remember, it is round. It's found in the cytoplasm. And most importantly, it's maternally inherited. Now, nuclear DNA, just a quick recap, also it's found in the nucleus of cells. It's double-stranded, and it's from both parents. So the DNA structure, just so we can really understand how nuclear DNA is used as a tool for, beekeep for beekeeping scientists, um, it's this long, double-stranded helix. And it contains these base pairs. Okay, So you have A, T, C, and G. I'll just call them that for short. And you can see how they link up on this double helix. And A and T are complementary, as well as C and G. And so you can see how this helix kind of joins and forms. And this helix, this DNA, as it's joined, it creates a sequence of these base pairs. So a DNA sequence might be C, T, G, A, T, blah, 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 and on and on and on. And these sequences are unique if you're closely related. They're not unique. They're only unique if you're not very closely related. So I'll show an example of this. It's a really good tool for understanding phylogenies, for building a family tree. Because the DNA contains information in the sequence of bases, the C, T, A, G, C, the sequence of the DNA varies. You can see here I have different <coughs> fly species, because I was getting sick of honeybees, gosh. Anyway, these fly species, if we were to look at their DNA, the same piece of DNA on each of those, their DNA sequences would be quite different because they're different species. But the, as soon as you get more closely related, so say this one right here, there's probably multiple species. This looks like some type of maybe surfid. There's multiple species of surfids. So if this was all different species of surfids, then their DNA sequence would be much more similar. Also, if we wanted to do my, mitochondrial DNA, so that circular DNA that's inherited from the mother, if I was to amp pull out that circle and amplify it and get the sequence, that G, C, T, A, G, whatever sequence, if I were to actually run that DNA through a gel, it'll tell me the different size of the DNA fragments. And what you're seeing here, each one of these lanes, these lanes here, is a different B. So here's one here, here's one here, here's one here, here's one here. And you can see there's different lines. These lines refer to a size of a fragment of DNA. And so this right here, these two right here, are similar. So they have the same maternal ancestry, okay, right here. And this, these ones all right here have the same maternal ancestry. So just from looking at a particular piece of their mitochondrial DNA, I can see what their maternal ancestry is. I can also see who has the same maternal ancestry. So I can determine Apis mellifera mellifera. I can determine Apis mellifera ligustica, Apis mellifera carnica, all by just looking at the mitochondrial DNA. 
So if anyone was, was to send me a sample of bees, I would pull out that mitochondrial DNA, a certain region of it, amplify it, put it on a gel, and then depending on the size of the fragment, the pattern, I can determine where it's from. Very cool. It's like a kit, you know, it's like a little magic kit. Okay. Now, nuclear DNA is a little bit different. Same basic idea, but remember, nuclear DNA is not circular. It's this double-stranded helix, and there is a lot of different areas on the nuclear DNA. There's coding areas that code for a specific gene, which will relate to a, a trait, but there's also these non-coding neutral areas called microsatellites. These microsatellites are simply kind of leftover DNA fragments that repeat and mutate over time. So a lot of times it'll be like GAC, 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 or TCG, TCG, TCG. So you can see it's repetitive. And it's the number of repeats in this microsatellite region that you amplify that you then compare from one B to the next to see how closely related they are. What's nice about nuclear DNA is that you're getting it from the dad and the mom. It's, just, it's not just a snapshot of the mom's genetics. Okay, so an example here, to better understand it, I have a worker from colony one. I have a worker from colony two. I want to know how closely related these two are, okay? Because I want to be able to see, okay, are, is, are my bees genetically diverse? Is this population of bees diverse? Because I just showed you all those reasons why genetic diversity is good. So I want genetic diversity. So if I was to amplify one particular microsatellite region, the same one, in worker one and worker two from two different colonies, and I got this result in this one, it's the size of that repeat unit is 137 and 149. Because remember, they have two chromosomes, right? So they're diploid. Now that same area, if I were to amplify it and look at that microsatellite, it's 135 and 145. So already, just from that one locus, that one microsatellite area, in that, in the, you know, on the B genome, I can see that they're not closely related. Now, what will give me more information to really assess how closely related they are and the true source of diversity is if I do 10 microsatellites, 20 microsatellites. If I do 50 microsatellites, oh my goodness, I can get a really good picture of how closely related these two bees are from these two different colonies. I hope I'm making sense. All right, so studies on evolutionary relationships, a lot of times we use both tools. We use mitochondrial DNA and we use nuclear DNA. And really, the DNA sequence similarities and differences help us to be able to make a, a tree. And not just a family tree, but an evolutionary tree of subspecies over time and how they've evolved. Or tiggers. <laughs> I love that tigger tree. Um, all right, so here's another example. This is actually data from some feral bee work that I did in the US. And these number here, uh, these refer to different states in the United States. So T is Texas, uh, AZ is Arizona, Louisiana, AL is Alabama, et cetera. So these are all feral cavities of bees that I collected from the United States. And I amplified a very particular region of DNA, okay? And so this same exact spot of DNA I looked at for all of these different bees. And so what I found, and I, I'm just blowing this up here, if we look at B1 and B2 and B3 and we start going down the sequence, you can see B1 and B2 are, have the same sequence. But B2 has a difference right here where this is CG, CG, theirs is GA. So right then, I can start to separate those out as being not as closely related. And I can start making my tree based on these differences, looking at all these sequences. So genetics are really important, but I just sometimes, I've been doing genetic work on bees now for over 10 years, and I get lots of questions because of Africanized bees. I do a lot of genetic work on Africanization. And Sometimes just working with your bees is the best way to judge if they're good. And I think we all know that. Um, and I get really tired when people send me samples. Oh, this, is, this hive is evil. Will you see if it's Africanized? I'm like, why waste the money? Just kill the queen. If it's evil, why do you want it? Who cares what it is? You know? 
I mean, come on. And so I think we get confused and tied up with this idea and this sensational, you know, sensation of these subspecies tags, and especially in the U.S. It's a joke. I mean, we have mutt bees, you know. We have, I have bees that are yellow, as yellow as your beautiful sweater, um, that, that when you look at their, their mitochondrial DNA are carniolans. Um, so breeding and, and the genetics in the U.S. mean nothing anymore. You know, I'm vending completely pure apis car carnica. I'm like, sure you are. You know, uh-huh. Okay, you, you keep telling yourself that. Um, so I think we should, n even though I love it and it's fun to do and it is exciting looking at the different, you know, remnants of subspecies, um, I think it's, we have to be careful not to get caught up in it. Um, and just do it, do it mainly for enjoyment and not for enforcement. And so that's kind of where I stand there. A little soapbox. You know, I'm not very soapboxy, but that one I am. Okay.